In this video, we will talk about the materials commonly used in microfluidics to make those uh, microchannels that uh, we have talked about in which the liquid flows. Uh, first topic will be to provide an overview of uh, commonly used uh, structural materials in, uh, in microfluidics. And then we will go over the various uh, materials that are most commonly used and uh, the ones that, that uh, we will most commonly use in our uh, course. So um, first topic will be polymers because uh, that is the largest group and uh, that is also the group in which we will work with. So by polymers I mean plastics uh, and uh, elastomers such as PDMS. Then uh, we will talk about uh, glass and uh, we will also talk about paper, which is uh, an upcoming um, field of, uh, of microfluidics to do microfluidics on paper. If you look at uh, the variety of materials that, uh, that we can use in, uh, in microfluidic systems, then um, on this side, we have microfabricated devices and uh, there will be a lecture where we talk about microfabrication. So this is technology that requires clean room facilities and uh, highly trained personnel. So it's expensive, but the results are also excellent. These, these devices have a uh, high aspect ratio and uh, very good resolution. Also uh, uh, good chemical resistance and the options that you have are to use glass, uh, silicon and, and metal. These can be combined in uh, the way that you like. Typically devices would be made of uh, glass and glass or glass and silicon having on uh, one side uh, the channels in the substrate and on the other side uh, is just a cover plate. And from metal you can also fabricate uh, um, electrodes or the chip can be made of metal if that is uh, necessary, for instance, for uh, excellent uh, thermal conductivity. On the other side, we have polymers, and this is what most people use. So this will be our largest group. And inside polymers, uh, I would like to make a difference between mass-produced uh, and small-scale uh, produced devices. So industry and research. Uh, we will mainly be here, but in the industry nowadays uh, the first microfluidic devices that uh, entered uh, the, the industry uh, they are typically made of plastics. For instance, uh, this device from uh, Minifab. Uh, it has a lot of different functions integrated onto it, but it is injection molded, which we also talk about later, not in this lecture. Uh, and, and it has, as we discussed previously, it has different laboratory functions integrated onto the chip in the form of different plastics that uh, are connected on the same chip. For instance, it can have integrated reagent storage, various channels for mixing and uh, separation and uh, reaction or uh, incubation and so on. PDMS. So this is a, a soft elastomer that you can mold to the desired uh, channel shape and it is very commonly used in combination with uh, glass slides. Uh, you will see what this means and also what the word stands for. Uh, polycarbonate and uh, polymethyl methacrylate or acrylic glass are also very commonly used for their uh, um, beneficial properties uh, such as uh, good chemical resistance, uh, relatively low price, um, easy uh, machining and so on, then transparency of course. And then we have 3D printed devices which uh, we will talk about today and this is also what you will do in the lab. Uh, so in uh, the experimental lab you can, um, you, can, you can 3D print and you can test uh, a microfluidic device and you can also learn how to design it and, uh, and then do some simulations with it to, uh, to verify your design. Paper microfluidics 
also exist and uh, are becoming popular in research. But uh, by paper microfluidics, I don't mean uh, immunochromatography assays. These are not really microfluidic devices. By microfluidics, I mean two-dimensional uh, paper networks, as I will talk about them later. Um, so when you think about conventional microfluidics, everyday microfluidics, if you like, mostly it means these kind of devices. This is a, a PDMS glass chip. I have already shown you something like this in a previous lecture. So this one is an H junction, which means uh, it has two inlets and two outlets and a channel going across. But uh, it can also have a T junction for combining two inputs into one output. And uh, for size scale, this is a five penny coin. So these are quite small. Uh, there's a glass layer and there's a PDMS layer. PDMS being uh, the soft elastomer that we will talk about in one of the next slides. This is PDMS. Um, it's uh, polydimethylsiloxane, and uh, what you get when you do when you work with this as a kit, you get uh, the monomer, and uh, then you get the curing agent that you need to combine ten to one for the the polymerization to take place. Uh, advantages to it are that uh, it is optically clear, uh, chemically inert, non-toxic and non-flammable. These are all good properties for microfluidics, especially that it is non-toxic, chemically inert and, uh, and optically transparent. It is an organic polymer. And um, the, the type that we use is uh, fully biocompatible. And uh, it is even used in uh, the food industry as an anti-foaming agent, not in Europe, uh, but in the US, uh, for instance, it is in uh, McDonald's French fries. Um, it's not dangerous. The, the precursor is dangerous, but uh, the polymer is not dangerous. It's uh, not going to react with you, it just passes through your body. And uh, what we use in uh, microfluidics is mostly down corning uh, or dial corning Silgard, uh, a type of, uh, of uh, PDMS mixture. So, again, advantage is it is inert, it doesn't react with uh, other chemicals. It is biocompatible. You can get down even to six nanometer feature size. So if your mold has a uh, uh, a minimum feature size of six millimeter, it can take the shape. The way we work with PDMS is typically that you take this uh, mixture of the elastomer and the curing agent and you pour it onto a solid uh, master. And then it will uh, cure and take the shape of the master after which you can remove it. It is just like stamping. But bubbles are problematic. And what I mean by bubbles is that uh, when you make this mixture, you trap bubbles inside and uh, either you apply vacuum or these bubbles will probably get stuck in your uh, PDMS. However, they do diffuse over time uh, out, most of them anyway, but uh, you can still have some, uh, some bubbles left in the mixture and this makes uh, production more difficult. Also, uh, uh, molding PDMS is highly uh, manual so need a lot of steps done by uh, people, by skilled uh, personnel, which uh, does not really help mass production of uh, PDMS-based devices, not to mention the other uh, disadvantages that it has compared to injection molded plastics, for instance, which is very highly standardized. And because of how common injection molding nowadays is, uh, it is also quite cheap. So you can, you can easily find uh, companies that can uh, fabricate molds for injection molding and who can perform the injection molding for you because it is used everywhere in the industry for various purposes. We have also a wide material selection in plastics. They are solid and um, they can be combined with, with other technologies. 
Um, however, if you need a high-end uh, product, if you need uh, something that is highly chemically resistant, that is resistant to high pressure and so on and high temperature, then glass is your choice. So these are examples of uh, glass microfluidic chips where one layer contains uh, the negative of the channels, the other layer is uh, a sealing layer. And um, you have the various ports for connections and then here you have the channels inside. Here also you have the channels inside. So this one is a junction chip where you have uh, multiple input ports and one output for mixing stuff. And um, the glass is expensive compared to the other technologies. Uh, I need to say that. Uh, silicon likewise, but uh, these require microfabrication. So glass that, uh, that is used in uh, microfluidics is often uh, uh, borosilicate or it can also be uh, silicate glass. But um, the reason for using glass, as I said, if you need a high-end application, it is temperature and pressure resistant, so you can really uh, apply a high pressure to it, which would burst your PDMS glass uh, chips. Uh, the, the problem about PDMS glass is the, the bonding strength, that uh, you need to connect uh, glass and the PDMS layer together with a high bonding strength to hold out against uh, pressure, and at high pressures these will burst. Uh, bonding together the same materials results in a better bonding strength. Um, and glass chips are uh, highly resistant to chemicals because uh, glass is very uh, resistant itself. It is highly transparent, uh, fully biocompatible, and gas doesn't permeate through it. So one more disadvantage to PVMS is that uh, it is permeable to gases. And uh, that is the reason why uh, oxygen bubbles or, or air bubbles can also uh, diffuse through it uh, during the curing process. Um, however, this uh, diffusivity or this permeability to gas can also be taken advantage of uh, in, in PDMS chips to make a vacuum driven flow. If you vacuum out uh, the PDMS, then uh, it can suck liquid in. And, uh, Glass chips have excellent quality control, but that applies to microfabrication in general. Uh, the only reason why not to use glass is because it's expensive, and the same applies to, to silicon. So this one is an example of a silicon glass chip, and you can see up close why you would do something like this. Uh, on the silicon wafer, you can combine other technology steps uh, with, with the fabrication of your chips. You can right away have the electrodes uh, uh, machined or, uh, or, or deposited uh, as metal layers onto your silicon wafer. And then uh, you can separately create your glass slide and bond them together. And the end result will be uh, once you uh, slice this or dice it up, then uh, you will get a um, bunch of very high quality chips. And uh, yeah, about silicon. So, silicon, sure, you have heard about it from other courses, but uh, it is a hard uh, crystalline semiconductor, and it is uh, it has been historically used as the substrate for microelectronics, but it is also often used uh, in MEMS and in BioMEMS too. So one of the, the previous lectures I talked about uh, neural probes with embedded uh, microfluidic channels. Those were also machined or micro-machined uh, out of uh, silicon. And it is sealed by bonding uh, glass or bonding polymer to it. So you can bond uh, glass or bond uh, uh, plastic to it or even PDMS. And here are some examples of uh, some microfluidic or uh, lab on a chip slash biomems type uh, devices. Uh, for instance, here is a PCR chip. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, but 
after the last two years, I'm sure everyone knows this already. So for DNA amplification, uh, there are various thermal zones on uh, this PCR chip. And uh, uh, input uh, micropumping, then uh, the fluidic channels that realize the, the liquid handling, including filtration. And then at the end, uh, there is a, uh, an electrochemical detection site. But the layers from a previous lecture, I would like to call your attention to, to this, that this is multi-layer. So the backside is silicon, that one has the electrodes. Above that is a polymer plate, which most likely has the channels. And then there's a, a front end or a front uh, PCB for making contacts. Um, so this is the kind of uh, level of integration that you can achieve with uh, silicon my base microfluidics, very high quality, um, but also more expensive than if you would do it from just polymers. So not, uh, not really suited for consumer applications, but for professional applications, uh, this is probably the best. And uh, why would you choose silicon? The reasons are similar to uh, glass, except that this is not uh, transparent, but it is also highly resistant to chemicals, uh, temperature, uh, and also has good heat conductivity. It's biocompatible. You can make uh, high aspect ratio structures from it and uh, quality control is excellent. The only problem is that it's expensive and not optically transparent. Now let's talk about plastics. And when we talk about plastics, then I mean thermoplastics. So plastics that are injection molded or hot embossed, or in another uh, way, thermoformed. And um, this is what you get, or this is what you get. So this is uh, a polymer chip, plastic chip, that has a reactor or incubation chamber, uh, a waste pad or collector pad, and then uh, the various uh, mixing channels with uh, solid reagents and uh, then sample input ports. And uh, this one here is a, a demo slide with a bunch of uh, different uh, ports to which you can connect. And then you have channels. Uh, this is a droplet generator chip, by the way, with various uh, sizes of junctions next to each other. And uh, with this one, you can do your test. You can plug in your tubing and uh, so the good thing about this is the slide itself is really cheap to make. Uh, they sell it at a premium, but it is cheap to make. Uh, and, and it is transparent, it is high quality, the reproducibility is good, and it is cheap. Let me just uh, say that again. So the advantage to using plastic chips is that it can be made really cheap, which is good for mass production. The problem is that you need to make the mold. The mold is expensive but we will talk about that later, not in this lecture. Um, so this here is another uh, such example with, with uh, injection molded uh, uh, channels. This is paper microfluidics, and uh, the two examples that you see here are uh, solved in an interesting way. They are not cut to size, but rather uh, they are screen printed to cover up areas in which we don't want the liquid to flow and leave open the areas where we want the liquid to flow. And in this way, you can create uh, two-dimensional channel networks by screen printing wax or something other uh, hydrophobic layer onto the paper, which is normally just uh, filter paper, which uh, uh, sucks water uh, quite well. This is a close-up example of uh, a 2D network where uh, also on the paper, you can bind uh, reagents, which, uh, which is an excellent way to create uh, a microfluidic system for uh, consumer use. However, this is still highly experimental. So no uh, industrial applications that I know of exist. In this video, we talked about commonly used structural materials in microfluidics, in particular, 
polymers, glass and paper and also silicon. 